Well, thank you for uh, having me. I've uh, talked to several of you, and uh, we have some people that have been in the sheep business in states that have lots of sheep, still have lots of sheep. We're going to find here in Arizona that the industry has pretty well uh, died out. There's only one family, but I want to start out and tell you how I got involved in sheep. I I'm not from Arizona. I'm from Ohio. And I went and had coffee at uh, Starbucks with a friend in, uh, out in Buckeye, uh, which is on the west side of the Phoenix area, if you're not familiar with it. And I, I said, you know, I've got to come up with a new talk. I have no idea. And she said, well, why don't you do the sheep? She was a, a, uh, worked for the agriculture department at one time, and she said, I'd have to drive out here, and, and all the sheep will be along the road. They'd be moving them from one field to the other. And I go, sheep? What do you mean, sheep? Then I, and my husband and I got to think, well, we lived over in Chandler before we lived out in the Buckeye area, and we remember the sheep in the fields in the early uh, 80s. And I said, okay, uh, now how do I go about doing that? Well, there, in the Buckeye area, it was a large winter grazing area for the sheep. And there would be 10, 15 families that would come in in the wintertime and they would have their sheep on fields that they either owned or they would have them on somebody else's. They would have alfalfa. Um, they would like to have them come in and, and help cut it down. Now, this would have been before the dairies came in because that's one of the things that pretty well eliminated the sheep here in Arizona. But um, so then they would move them and people would uh, complain because they were trying to drive their car. And of course, sheep have the right of way just like cattle do. All right. And since he brought up cattle, I want to point out cattle came after the sheep in Arizona. Sheep industry is much older than the cattle industries, just in case you didn't know that. So um, there, there will be other stories I will tell as we go along that as I met these families, these are the people I'm going to be telling you about. They're the ones that I traveled with where I could. Um, part of the industry was pretty well gone by the time I got involved in 2014. And because of that, uh, it was slim pickings of who I could really go out uh, with their sheep. And so there was just this one family that now is three generations that are left in the state that have large um, herds of sheep or flocks of sheep. But there are lots of sheep still in the state of Arizona, but most of those are up on the Navajo Reservation because each family can own up to 35. The government restricts how many sheep they can have, and we'll come back and talk about that in a minute. But my presentation is called Sheep, Dogs, Donkeys, and as somebody said, why donkeys? And we'll know about it in a minute. And shepherds, because we need all of them to make the sheep industry, obviously. The, as you can see here, the donkeys are the pack animals for them. Uh, these guys are on the road or on the trails, taking their sheep up to winter or summer grazing area, and they are out maybe a whole week where they do not see the people who own the sheep, so they have to take all their supplies. So we'll see some pictures of that. So the presentation is going to concentrate on early sheep industry here in the state of Arizona. It's going to talk about a few of the historic uh, photographs that I have. There could be a lot more. I mean, I could bore you for hours upon hours with just all the old photographs. Um, one of the things is when I would talk to these families, do you have any pictures? They go, you know, we were herding sheep. We didn't have time to take pictures. And anyhow, they didn't have cell phones. Uh, we're talking in the tens and twenties and thirties of the 1900s, they didn't have cell phones. They were lucky if they talked to somebody else except for the two people they were herding the sheep. And then we'll get into the cyclical cycle of sheep ranching. How it, is it done here in Arizona? And it's totally different than the east. In the east, uh, we're gonna find that people have small herds of sheep. They can have them on their land. They don't move them. Here in the West, we move our animals. Some places we move them a lot more. 
Um, you may have moved yours. Um, you may not have uh, moved all of them, but um, Idaho does uh, move their sheep. Uh, they do in Utah. The trails, uh, we'll talk about what does that mean? What is going on with those trails? And we'll talk about on the trail because I did get to spend some time with these herders out on the trail. Uh, the earliest record of sheep in Arizona goes back to the 1600s. And that deals with the Navajo and Hopis who got them from the Spaniards who came into New Mexico, brought them into the Pueblo. Remember, they, uh, the Pueblo Indians threw the Spaniards out, but they didn't take their sheep with them. It was a Shiro sheep. And so they talk, uh, brought those across. So those are the reasons why the Navajo and the Hopi have so many. And they do mostly have just the Shiro sheep, which is the picture I have up here. Uh, the 1690s, the 1700s, we know Father Kino came in. He brought merinos. He brought them in out of Mexico into the southern portion of Arizona, no farther than the Gila River because um, that was the only area that was Spanish territory. But he did bring them in. He did teach the people how to make wool blankets, how to uh, obviously then shear the sheep, eat the meat. He would take animals as he went to the different missions he would have people take the animals, uh, cattle and the sheep, ahead of him. So when he went, he would have food to, for the people. And then he would send more animals onto the next spot that he was going. So he had a real good system with his rancherias and his um, missions that he did. In the 1850s, which is about the earliest that we knew of sheep here in Arizona, um, they came across from New Mexico to California. 1840. Uh, 49, what happened? Gold rush. And the men were eating cattle and they would eat lots of sheep. It was sheep, okay? Um, it, it didn't cost them a lot. And so they could buy sheep in New Mexico for 25 cents and sell them for $10, $20 to the miners uh, for the meat. And so they were making a, a lot of money. In the 1860s, and uh, I do want to point out that it was because of Beale uh, with his camels coming across that he talked about the tall grass. And everybody said, well, this was a good area. But they migrated the sheep across the California. It wasn't until the 1860s that we start seeing them coming back into uh, Arizona. First of all, California had depleted all the ones in New Mexico, so New Mexico needed stock at this point in time. So they brought in the sheep and took them across to New Mexico. And the guys saw, hey, this is nice grass area. Nobody had been uh, utilizing the grass. The cattle wasn't here. Um, so uh, it was good land. New Mexico then started to say, well, okay, let's bring them back. And we're going to talk about a couple of those people. And then California during different drought periods, also in the 1860s, started to bring them in. Uh, so our sheep coming into Arizona came from California as well as New Mexico. In the 1870s, we have the first uh, people that brought in sheep. Um, George and Elizabeth Johnson brought about three, 400 sheep with them. They settled in Johnson Canyon, which is up near Williams, if you've ever been up in that area. It's a very remote area. Um, and the railroad was going through up in that area. That's how the name uh, Johnson Canyon, they said, well, you're there. We'll just call the canyon after you. Um, and Mr. Johnson uh, was a captain in the military. He had been moving all over and finally decided that he wanted to get into the sheep business. Um, he would twice a year go to Prescott. He would be gone and he would leave his wife with four young children at this point in time to fend for themselves, take care of the sheep. Um, and um, he ended up getting very ill. His wife took him by buckboard to Prescott, where he did die in 1882. She was pregnant with the fifth, yeah, the fifth child, um, and she left her young kids to take care of the sheep and the ranch and everything while they were gone. 
We don't know where he's buried. We do have it in the newspapers up in Prescott that he did pass away. Um, they tell us what he uh, died of, but we have no record. He's not in any of the cemeteries that we can find up there. The Johnson family got a hold of me. Um, and if you picked up my um, flyer, it tells you about um, my blog and everything. And so people get on and I get lots of stories about things because of that. Uh, Juan Candelaria, and they brought their sheep out of the California area. Juan Candelaria brought his sheep into, um, from New Mexico, and he was a little bit special. His great-grandmother had gotten sheep out of Mexico, out of Veracruz. They came on a ship across. She was able to get them. She hired slaves, uh, criminals down in the Veracruz area and forced them to take her sheep northward into New Mexico. She then was able to expand her herd. And when things got bad over in New Mexico, they decided to split the herd and he brought some in. And the uh, Candelarias are still up in the Concho area today. They don't have any sheep up there except for small herds. So just some quick pictures, this early Tucson and the early 1900s with the sheep moving across. Um, a sheep camp, uh, but you can see uh, the, the tent wouldn't be real pleasant in this heat, would it? Um, bed rolls and things, um, a group of them, um, of the sheep herders, this is about 1940 that that picture was taken. Um, uh, most of these pictures, as I said, have been given to me by the families when they did have them. Um, I made them go back and really search through because they said they didn't even think about the pictures that they may have, and that forced them to have a record of them. And I, I'm really trying to get them to either give them to a museum or let me have them so I can catalog them, and, and we have that record. Um, this is from the Ryan uh, family um, who had sheep up in this area, more over in Heber area, but um, how they took the wool. Uh, they don't do it that way today. Um, and I, I have to mention that uh, Woodrow Wilson had them on the lawn during World War I. He didn't want to use the gas for the lawnmowers, so he brought up a herd of sheep from George Washington's estate. Um, and George Washington did have them uh, at that time uh, when he was president. Uh, Jefferson also had them. He had them on the lawn, Jefferson, at the White House. Um, but a little boy sighted the cut across, and one of the rams did not like that, and it killed the little boy, so he had to take his home. But he, he was really doing a good study on them, and so he needed them. Even though he was president, he couldn't go down to his place all the time, so he brought up part of his herd of sheep. But we did have them. Um, in um, on the uh, the lawn, and you can see that they even had the babies, the little lambs. Um, a, a few things uh, here in Globe. There wasn't a lot of sheep in the Globe area, but we know that there was sheep in the Globe area because of the market, uh, the price of the the sheep. Uh, the one gentleman, the Central Beat Market, he was saying genuine sheep. There was controversy that he was selling goat meat instead of sheep meat. And so he wanted to make sure, there was a great big article in the paper back in the uh, early 1900s. Uh, Patrick Ch uh, Shanley um, had a meat market in the 1890s. And in 1889, I've, uh, a friend sent me that, and she's related, she one of the Ryans. Um, she uh, sent me that, and I started looking for his name in the, in the early newspaper. And in 1889, he bought a band of sheep. So, I mean, there was people that had him up here, but I'm sure that he wanted them for the market. And the reason why I say that is I put the market in bakeries on here. I only put the market portion. Some of the places were saying they used 2,000 sheep on a yearly basis in their market. So that means they had to have a lot of sheep in the area. Some of them talked about that they would go down into the Gila Valley and get sheep. So it was in Gila County that they were getting most of those sheep that they were using for you people up here uh, consuming sheep. And please go back to consuming sheep. Uh, we need that in the state. Um, and one of the other things that I thought was interesting in my research was the fact that 
um, uh, there was a city ordinance. You weren't allowed to have sheep go through the town. You couldn't have cattle go through. You couldn't have pigs, horses, and you couldn't slaughter the animal within a mile uh, because of the smell and everything. So I just thought those, those are the little interesting things that I find when I'm doing my research that just make a nice smile on my face. And um, So let's get into the presentation. Where do most of the sheep herders come from? Well, in the 1880s, 1890s, many of them would have been bass that came over from the Spain and France area. And if you know anything where the Basque area is, it's on the border between Spain and France in the Pyrenees. And most of these gentlemen that came over would have been second sons, once in a while first son. First sons got the land there so they could stay and they, their families herded sheep in and, and the area. So there was no reason for them to leave, but their brothers learned the sheep business and so they came over here. Most of them thought they were gonna make their fortune and then they could go home and lead a nice life because they could buy maybe a little business over there, maybe just do nothing, uh, go back and live in the family home. Uh, but a lot of them, they went back maybe for a couple years and then they missed the sheep business because they couldn't do it over there. And so they would come back. And many of them then decided also to spend the money that they had raised or earned during this period of time to buy their own and get into the business themselves. So we do have a lot of bass sheep herders in the Western United States. They're not in the East because those are the little farms and the people are family oriented. So this is not my story. As I said, I've never had a sheep in my life. Uh, well, I can say I have sheep because I go down and get my fix all the time on uh, sheep from the houses. But this is one of the families I was able to interview. Uh, this is the Manarolas. Um, that's Frances Aliman, and we'll come back and talk about her. This is the family I do most of my work with. This is the Aza. There's three generations. So there's mom and dad, and their son, and then his son. Uh, he just bought out the um, Manarolas. Um, uh, Irene Aha's husband, uh, Basilio, she was the one that gave me all the information. She was the one I went to to be able to uh, start looking for sheep industry information. And she had, she had six kids. None of them were interested in doing the sheep history. She had all these notebooks when I went over. And so she was really excited, but she had to check you out. The Basque are very, very private. And so we would talk, and she said, well, call me in a week. So I called her in a week. She said, yeah, come on back. So I went back. She had a notebook that thick of all the names of everybody and everything that she could remember about the sheep industry. And it became a, a good friendship. Unfortunately, she died uh, just about a year ago. Um, but, I mean, I could go over and just pick her brain, and she just loved the fact that somebody finally did the history of the industry that she had been involved in uh, because her family came over in the uh, early 1900s. So um, uh, Pete Espiel had one of the largest sheep. Uh, this is one of the sheep bridges, um, one of the old camps. And then um, uh, um, Echemende, so just some of the people, but these are all people that were, um, oh, I forgot, I, uh, the lady would be very mad at me if I didn't mention her. Uh, that was a uh, Perry that had sheep up in the Prescott area. So let's look at where the grazing areas were over the years. Obviously, they came into Yavapai County first out of California. All right, and then some of them also came into the San Francisco Peaks area. Some of them then moved their sheep up to that area. Uh, the one arrow points over to the Ash Fork area. Uh, that was, uh, would have been um, uh, Johnson. Um, they came into the Winslow area. This is what we're gonna find is Candelaria uh, coming over, uh, but, um, the Navajo County area, Concho's up in that area. You also had the Mormons that came in, and actually they're the only ones that set up very early on a mill. They actually had a mill because there was so much sheep uh, on the reservation, and when they got them to shear them, and uh, when they first went in and had them, um, they, they saw the sheep up in that area, they were shearing with a knife. 
And then they, the Mormons were real smart. Okay, these were the shears that they would use back in those days. I, 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 I can't even do it. I don't have the strength in my hand. I, I can imagine if I did that day in and day out, I would have had uh, strength in my hand. But that's what they brought in for them, which meant that the wool was a lot better. But they, you, you can still see the Navajo shearing today with a knife. And they don't cut the skin. I mean, it, because the animal is very important to them in their the culture, so they don't have that. Um, the, the mill didn't last very long because everybody got the sending to um, California, so it only lasted a few years. Um, they started to come into the White Mountains and the Mogollon Rim area, um, and that was also out of New Mexico. Um, they came out of a different, couple different places to settle in the Pima County, Ch uh, Cochise area. Many of the Texans came over when drought was in Texas. They would bring their sheep in and then they would take them back uh, when it was better over there. Texas has the largest herd of sheep in the uh, country. Um, but you saw the picture of the sheep going across and a lot of that. Um, they went across, obviously, the southern route to get into California for um, the miners. Uh, Yuma has some sheep because there are some cooler areas up in the Yuma area, up in the, uh, the mountains, up in that area. But mostly that is the area where they use to um, do the feeder lamps. So you have your lamps someplace in the valley, and then you give them off to somebody who's going to fatten them up so they go off for market. And that's a large area today, and it goes over into the California side. One of the Ozas is doing that today. Um, and then the Maricopa area, where you would see them coming in, starting in the, the, the 20s and 30s, they would br bring them in when the snows were so bad in the northern area that they could not be up there in the wintertime. You got them coming in around the Verity River, Black Canyon City, down into Cave Creek, even down into... Um, Mesa and Chandler, which was in Mesa and Chandler at that time, and they would feed on the alfalfa fields in the wintertime. And they would bring these animals all down by trail, not using trucks or anything. Um, uh, they also would bring them down by uh, rail. Um, the area that we don't know a lot about is the sheep up on the uh, Arizona Strip. Um, I've been to Utah and talking to some people up at the Southern Utah University that all the, pretty much all the people up there came from um, Utah and Nevada. And they've never done their history and was looking for somebody, so I probably going to end up doing that for them. But uh, it, it's real interesting because um, a lot of the people brought their sheep into Arizona so they didn't have to pay taxes in Utah or Nevada. And Arizonas would also do the same thing, take them the other direction. Because as we're going to find, as they were crossing into different counties, there was a transient tax on these animals. And sheep were notorious for, let's just get them through and not tell or they would hide sort of the sheep uh, so that they didn't have to pay on. But the sheriffs usually caught up with them. So uh, that, that's what's going on. So let's, we're going to turn now to the yearly cycle of sheep ranching here in Arizona. Um, we're going to talk about the summer, uh, since this is now the summer portion. Uh, June to October, they're going to be in the northern portion or up along the Mogian Urim, the, Mount, um, uh, the White Mountains. Then in September, they'll do what's called tagging. You're going to see pictures of all this, so um, I'll show you that. Then they were winter trucked to um, uh, down here into the valley. Now all the sheep go to Casa Grande. Um, they, some of them do go down to the Wilcox area. The gentleman has... Um, a, a ranch down there and he takes them to um, November to February they will lamb it's a three month period of time because we find out that when they do tagging they find out that some of the females haven't gotten pregnant yet so they'll send them out with a maybe two males instead of one male to one of uh, 50 animals or female 50 females and so then they'll be the late in lambing sometimes they're even later than that um, even into March when we were down this past year, that was March and they were still having the babies. Um, shearing and docking, we'll talk about that happening then. Usually February, you have a circuit of the, uh, the people who will come in 
and do the shearing. And, it, and since we don't have a lot of sheep here in Arizona, they are slim pickings as to when they get the, the people coming in. It's an outfit usually out of Bakersfield and they just travel the Western state. And then when they're not doing it here, many of those guys go to Australia and they will shear down there. Um, so it's a big production. The lambs then go off the market and then they walk in May if they are going to be able to walk. There was two trails up until a few years ago. Now there's only the one trail and this year they weren't able to use it. And I'll talk about that here in a minute. So uh, your sheep driveways at one time there was in 1918 we knew 51 designated driveways. Um, the um, um, president um, Roosevelt designated driveways that went out. There was an agreement between a sheep man, a cattle man, and the Forest Service as to where the trails were going to be. Uh, because the cattle man, obviously, by that time, didn't want them in their area because they do chomp down. If you don't keep them moving, they'll chop the grass down. In drought periods, you really don't want the sheep in the area coming through. So there was all the controversy with the um, um, cattle people at that point in time. But um, T today, there is only two trails actually being used. There used to be the Heber Reno. Uh, that hasn't been used, and it's pretty well not going to be able to be used. I am going to show you some pictures on it, though. Um, uh, the boundaries were usually no more than five miles wide for the sheep to be in, and they had to stay in that area. They could be fined if they got out of that area. Um, and there was boundary markers. Uh, the Heber Reno Trail, real quick, it's the longest sheep trail in the United States. It, it, if you go all the way and you go over to the Morgan Mountain Driveway and go over towards Springerville, it's about 260 miles long. And there would be people, it could take them anywhere from uh, four weeks to six weeks, depending on if there was good water in places and things of that nature, if they could move the sheep a little quicker, they did. So I'm just gonna show you a few pictures. This is them crossing the Salt River. And along the river, then the trail as they're starting uh, up. They did use horses as well as donkeys. And we'll come back to that. Hmm? Yes, a sheep or not a cowboy. <laughs> and you see the dog behind, all right? There are two types of dogs. We'll talk about those in a minute. Um, this is one of my favorite pictures of the, the sheep going. I mean, that, that's a lot of sheep. And, and the sheep, they'll make their own trail. If, they, if the sheep in front of them aren't going faster, or they see better grass over that way, they'll just go. You know, uh, sometimes they didn't want to move, and that's one of the problems. That's the reason why you have the two different types of dogs. One is a protector dog. Um, that's the uh, Great Pyrenees, but they do use other dogs. Uh, they've been the most effective. They, the Great Pyrenees are the Australian um, shepherd they'll use. Um, the other little dogs are collies, and they're the ones that help move the sheep. They're the ones that get the commands that the herders uh, get them to move. Uh, they, they'll nip at their uh, heels of the, uh, the sheep uh, to get them to move. Uh, the, the, the sheep don't even fill it through the wool. Uh, um, so. Uh, the donkeys are carrying the men's supplies. It is on part of the Heber Reno Trail. It could be a good week before the herder who owns the sheep, the sheep raiser, can get in to get a more supply. So they have to carry everything. They also carry dog food. So they carry great big bags of dog food. They carry their sleeping bags. They carry all their food. They are allowed to kill a lamb along the way, but obviously they're going to want to be in uh, some place where they're going to be several days for that because otherwise they're not going to be able to carry it along with them without it spoiling. So they'll do that. There's one of the great Pyrenees. E or the west part of the state. This is on the east. And then we're now going to move over to the e or the west part of the state. This is on the east. And these are the ones that I really followed. I, I went up every year. I went up um, and, and got these uh, uh, films. I'm just going to show you real briefly. They're coming under underpass or up near um, Cottonwood. And we're going to go down so that we're going to cross the Verde River. There is a fence area. I had a group of people that day that decided that they wanted to see the sheep, and they just would not get out of the way of the sheep and 
sheep started going the opposite direction. And you can see that the Great Pyrenees the, the, with these, uh, this family, they know me, the sheep know me, so I don't have any problem. Because the trail is not as bad going up there as you're gonna find going up the Hebrew Reno, you know, because I mean, you'd go up the mountain and come down the mountain, go up the mountain and come down the mountain. This you don't have. It's pretty gentle uh, rise. You're gonna go over, this trail takes you along I-17, because I-17 used to be the sheep trail before they build I-17. And so there's underpasses, and then they'll end up going over towards uh, the Williams area. Um, wanted to put this in because this is the, what they carry in those boxes. Everything, their supplies, their food, uh, their bedroll. Um, so it's very, very important, those uh, boxes. Um, and the donkeys, and they just load everything up on them. Uh, one of the old pictures, this is Fermin uh, Echemende, who is, um, or Cheveria, excuse me. This is Irene's dad. Um, so that's how I got all the information I did. Uh, the boxes, when uh, they didn't have a picnic table, they were the picnic table. Uh, so all the dishes, that's John Aliman. And uh, going across the Salt River again, um, this is the Dobson. Um, the sheep, the Sheep Springs Sheep Company. Um, and then that's Frank Alza, who built that bridge back during World War II because it was very important to have sheep. And uh, they couldn't cross the river many times when we had our large rain, uh, rainstorms or the snow and this melody. The sheep couldn't get across and they were losing so many. And it was 20 sheep to make one gentleman's outfit for the military in World War II. So the sheep were very important all across the country. They needed lots and lots of sheep. So they even set up little boy and girl clubs for um, having them raise sheep so that they would have it uh, during this period of time. But Frank Ozzo was a man that made sure that that bridge got built. And he just took sheep herders and they just uh, built it using cables from the mines and everything that had been abandoned. He just scavenged everything because you couldn't buy anything. There was a little bit of material they had to buy. It's unfortunate that the bridge, uh, this one is no longer there. There is a bridge there, but it's not this one. I'll talk about that when I get to that picture. Um, they would funnel the sheep so that they could count, make sure that at so many points they wanted to make sure they hadn't lost any sheep. The, the bells on them would tell them, usually the sheep would follow the same bell, usually about 100 sheep. And so if he didn't hear that bell, because all of them make different sounds, I have a bell up here, um, they would go ahead and start to look for them. 100 sheep you lose, that's a lot of money to a sheep sheep herder, or sheep uh, ranger. This is the bridge over the um, uh, Verity River. This is the old one with the sheep on it. This is the one today. They, this was made all out of wood. And there is places down around here, as you can see, nice places for people to go in camping. And they decided, well, hey, that's wood. That's easy for us to go get. Let's just tear the bridge apart and use it for fire. And one of the Alza's daughters fell through the bridge. Thank goodness there was a lot of water. She didn't get hurt. But you can go and visit the bridge if you go. There's a couple different ways. If you want information, I can give it to you later on. Um, this is them um, back on the other trail. They, if they were going to the west, they, a lot of times if they were down in the Phoenix area, they would go across this bridge. And then they would veer off and go over towards uh, Black Canyon City and then head up northward. Um, I put this in because, uh, you know, you take your kid to, to work. Well, that bucket has two baby dogs in it for them to take out every night to teach it to be a sheep dog. The sheep don't like water. So you really have to push them. I mean, they'll go and get a drink. That's not a problem. But they don't like moving across. And we had a problem this year. They did not want to go across. So you can see the guy in the back. He is uh, trying to uh, pull one. If you're, you get one going across, everybody follows. I decided that this one year I'd be real smart. I was always getting their butts taking the pictures that they went across. And I decided that wasn't fun. I didn't want to see their butts. So I got one of the herders to take me across because the water was you know, not real deep as you can see there, but deep enough that it could sweep me down and I had my camera and everything. I didn't want to ruin that. So I got him to take me across. And I thought I'd stand as the sheep came towards me and get these great pictures. Notice the dog also. Now the dog is a hindrance here now. 
because he wants the sheep to keep moving. And this gentleman right here is one of the herders. He's not hitting him, he's hitting the water to get him to move back. All right? And you can see where the sheep are not happy because I'm standing there. Because they didn't want me there, most of them, when they came off, they would stand there and they would shake all the water off of them. I was sopping wet. I, I, every time I would see that happening, and my camera's up here as high as I could get it. Um, still trying to photograph at the same time. Um, but yeah, it was sort of funny. On the trails, and these are from the eastern side. This is off of the Hebrew because they don't, um, they don't have any over on the west side. These are the, the water storage areas so that they would dump water into these or if there was water available that they would pump in and then they would give the water to the sheep at different points. They can go usually about three days before they would have to have any uh, water. Um, then we're up on the summer grazing area in the uh, forest. An old sheep camp dating back to the 1900s. You see that the family's here in this picture, but it's usually the two guys, the camp tender who's gonna cook all the food and the guy who has to watch the sheep and, and count for them and everything. So they get pretty lonesome. So they draw on the aspen trees. And I didn't put any of the ones in that were, well, a little risque. Well, let's say a lot risque. Um, but they carved their names. Uh, they'd have nice pictures of women. You can imagine what those were on their eyes. Tagging is where they're going to do two things. They're going to take all that wool around their eyes because they get sheep blindness, okay? And then they're going to do the use and they're going to sh uh, uh, shave their tummies because when they're going to give birth and they need to feed, they need to make sure that the uh, lambs can find the, uh, and, and the tits and, and go ahead and uh, feed. Um, so that the tagging operation is, you know, they go out and they'll set this up um, and the guys get paid. These are the same people that will come in and do the actual shearing then in February. Um, but you can see that uh, her face is cleaned out and he's doing her tummy. But this is after they've been at the wool salon. Well, hey, they have to look pretty too, right? Now, they, the rams should have already done their duty, but if they haven't, they're, they're all, those ewes are put back out. Uh, they will still uh, shear them and everything, but uh, they will. It, it, it's usually one ram to uh, 50, maybe 100 pence on. If the ram has been really good, uh, they'll put him out. So if the, if the, the, the ewes are not, we blame the males. So... Um, th this is how they will do the, I, I was talking to some lady who was saying that, uh, you know, you used to have the stamp on the bags. Remember the bag in the truck? Uh, it was always the little kids that got put in those, the stamp. They would put wool in and put more in, and you, you'd stomp on that so that you got a bag that was four to 500 pounds of wool in it. Today, it's a machine, and the guy, this machine is running the whole time he's putting his hands in. I mean, they get a really tight bag at this point in time. And they will count the sheep. Yeah, the, the people that have now done the tagging and, um, and doing the, the females need to know so that how much are they going to get paid. And it's real interesting. And I, I, I've never really been able to do it. I would go one, two, three, four. No, no, no. They, they can count so that they see like 50 or whatever going by. Um, and, and they have two or three people, and if they don't agree, they bring them all back out, and they start the process all over. A lot of times, um, the, the you is a new mom, and she doesn't know what she's supposed to do. Um, she doesn't have the experience of her, somebody experience telling her. So that's what the shepherd is supposed to do. He's supposed to know that mom is not feeding baby. Okay, baby is born. Mom, you need to put, get together. So he will take the, the baby over. He, in this case, he is sitting on the you and putting the baby to the, the nipple so that it, because it's important, just like with babies, human babies, you know, that first milk is important for the growth that, that we're finding out about. Um, and it's very important that they, they need that. And a lot of times when people come and they steal the babies and they haven't had that, the babies are not going to survive. 
survive because they need that special milk in the beginning. Um, and, and unfortunately, this day, uh, they were lucky they were able to save that one. They weren't able to save two other ones. They, 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 it's, unfortunately, they just have their babies whenever. You know, it's just like us. We have our babies whenever. And so um, they didn't catch the two, so they get them the mom. Uh, it was uh, a cold morning up in the Flagstaff area. It was 25 degrees, so that's not good for the, the sheep and the baby. But this one did survive. And about the end of October, November, they get thrown off the Forest Service land. Uh, they do pay to do that. And what happens is that they'll move them down. Now, I'm going to back up for a minute because I promised you a story. When you saw the sheep going across at the river and I'm standing on the one side, the next year, there was a group of kayakers came through. And we told them that the sheep were coming through. And they said, well, they had a right to be there. We said that was fine, but you don't have a right to block this. this is a trail, a legitimate trail. You can't block it. You have to let us use it for the sheep. So they said, well, they're going to set up their camp. So they go up a little ways, and they set up their camp right in the path. And the sheep just went right on through it, all tents, everything, just obliterated. And we said, Come on, folks, we told you, don't do it. When they take them down by the truck, it's from the Williams area down to the valley, and they'll come down I-17, they don't come down Chino Valley or anything, but um, I-17 and then get them in the Casa Grande, it's about a five hour trip. I mean, those guys haul it down the, the hill and then they need the water because they are gonna be pregnant at this point in time, so they wanna really move them. The, the babies are going to start being born. The shepherd is very important. He has his uh, shepherd hook out there. And um, if you get twins, and once a lamb has twins, she will always have twins, um, which is good because it used to be that the wool would pay the um, person's expenses and the lambs gave them extra money that they could go ahead and use. But what they will do is they will get the two baby lambs and they will hobble them together because usually one, just like kittens or uh, dogs, there's one that's always uh, stronger than the other and he will, or her, she will hobble the other one over to mom so that they both get the drink. So these are handmade by the sheep herders um, and it's one of the things they do in the evening when they don't have anything else to do. Now they have a uh, little place that they can stay in and where they have a television because they have the, the solar that they can use. If they do have a lamb that mom rejects for one or two reasons, sometimes she just won't feed it. And that will be the responsibility of the herder to do. So that's what the guy is doing. He's feeding, they're called lepies here in Arizona. Uh, or the other thing is that if she has lost a lamb, she sometimes will try to take somebody else's. So they'll cut the, uh, the skin in off of the dead one and put it over one that they need to have fed. And within a couple of days, she will not realize it's not hers and, and then she won't take it back or let you take it back so it can be fed. Uh, once that all happens, or they get, then go into shearing, uh, the feeder lambs, uh, they're not sheared. They don't have any really much uh, uh, wool on them at this point in time. Darrow's are the old, old bags. This is one of the uh, espiels, and the gentleman is uh, uh, grating the wool because it depends on how strong it is and, and what you can uh, get for it. Today, it's going for like about 20 cents a pound. So they're not making a lot of money. Uh, uh, and in good cases, they are just being stored in warehouses. They, they can't even sell it. Um, Mr. Rovey, which is down in the valley, he has about 1,800 sheep. He's going into the hairless sheep, so he doesn't have to worry about um, shearing, but he does still have something he has to shear. He can't get rid of uh, the wool. Nobody even wants it because we don't have the wool mills here anymore. We do have a new one that started in North or South Carolina a couple years ago. They're starting one up back up in the New England area. There is a small one up in Prescott. There, the one up in the Williams area is um, probably going to go defunct. Uh, he said he's going to go into something else. So let's look at some of the reasons for the sheep business decline. Government, bureaucracy. Uh, it was one of the biggest things, and where you could take your sheep, what you can do. The, the Indians found that out of how many sheep they could have. 
uh, predators, obviously. Uh, importation of foreign lamb and wool. Um, if you look and you'll see in our grocery stores, it's not U.S. lamb. Um, I buy all my lamb from Rovi because I know that it's fresh. Or I have a friend who has the uh, hairless sheep and, and she'll slaughter some of her animals. She has a market for hers. And, and I'll get them from them. I don't buy the, the lamb from New Zealand because their government subsidized the sheep industry. We don't subsidize anymore. And because we took those subsidi uh, subsidies off, um, it's really hard for the sh uh, sheep. And it's getting harder with just all the bureaucracy going on. Um, there's no source of feed. And this really goes back to when the sheep were going into the, the Phoenix area, the, the Maricopa area. Once dairy cows and people wanted to drink milk, they started to take those alfalfa fields over and there wasn't a place for the sheep in the winter time. You got the endangered species and wildlife. The Hever Real Trail, used to see over 100,000 sheep on it on a yearly basis. It got down to 8,000, which wasn't enough for them to do anything with. And that was because they said the domestic sheep were giving the um, mountain sheep a disease. We found out it was the white cottontail deer. It wasn't sheep that was giving it to them. But once it gets in their minds, they do not change, unfortunately. Grazing and water rights, um, the Forest Service. I was out one day where a gentleman, uh, well, not one of the Manarolas, he was moving the sheep off the forest, and I go, why are you moving your sheep? The grass was that high. I mean, it was up to my waist, and he said, they only could be on it for three days. I go, but that is the area up around Gra um, um, Prairie, uh, now I can't say the word, Garland Prairie, um, where the, the wildfire went through all that grass, just burned it. I mean, and you get it going and then it goes under the trees, it goes to the trees, but Forest Service says, and you can only be there for so long. Uh, the driveways, if you don't use them, you lose them. So the only one that's left open is the ones on the west side. This year we weren't able to do it. Verity River had too much water, so they couldn't get them across. Um, the sheep lose their footing pretty easily, and when they get pushed with all the sheep behind them, um, there has to be too many people out there to grab the sheep. Um, and I'm not strong enough to do that, so it has to be some of the guys. They get a whole family up there. I mean, they bring all their friends and everybody else that helps them. But even at that, if the river's too high, and then the Forest Service could say, sorry, you can't do it. Then if it gets dry, they, the guys can't eat because they're cooking fires to cook their meals. So they, they can't do that. So there, there's just real problems. And this trail, that the last trail may be gone here in another year or two. If you don't use it at least once every 10 years, you lose them. So the Hebrew Renal Trail is gone. Um, future sheep in Arizona, well, it doesn't look real bleak, even though I gave you six things there. Uh, wool processing, there is the two plants. Uh, Mystic Pines is the one probably going to go under. There is such a thing as sheep cheese. Uh, Rovi makes it. Um, there's a place in uh, Aguila that has, um, does the same thing. He sends his milk, unfortunately, to California. We're trying to get him to keep it here and make the, the cheese here. And it's real good. Uh, if you've never tried it, uh, you can get it at the grocery store. It's going to be from out of the country. But if you like it, then you can start looking for it here in Arizona. Uh, Rovi has it in different places in the uh, valley. Uh, education, there is a program called Make It With Wool. Uh, started in Arizona. Frances Aliman, that picture I showed you, the woman with the sheep, she started the Make It With Wool because she wanted to uh, bring the industry uh, forward. And so she got women who would go out and go out to schools and convince people that you get your kids to sew using wool, that if you use the right type of wool, merino wool can be uh, worn in the summertime, even in the hot desert. Uh, it just depends on the wool. I mean, you wouldn't use churro for clothes, so different types of uh, wool and things like that. But um, so we have that, the flag wool and fiber festival, where I got my earrings from. Um, you know, they, they, they try to promote uh, the, the wool industry here with that. Uh, wool garments for the military have come back. Um, those are the dress blues. Uh, keep cheering and sheep husbandry to a younger generation. They're doing that with FFA and 4-H. 
and you could support new sheep ranchers. That's not going to happen here in Arizona because we only have the one family. When you had an organization, you could go out and, and um, the American sheep industry itself does help people who want to get started in it. Maybe it's a family member that, um, you know, it needs the funds to be able to buy the sheep. And so they will help on that. But that's not going to happen here in Arizona. Uh, just unfortunate on that. But we do have a new sheep herder that, or sheep uh, raiser that's moving into the Wilcox area. He's coming out of Montana. Uh, that got a hold of me and decided he was going to. So it, it, he said he's a small operation. So once he said he gets all set up and everything, I'll be able to go down there. So what you can do to help out? <laughs> eat lamb. Don't eat turkey. <laughs> and so thank you. If you enjoyed the presentation, I do have books for uh, sale. Uh, the, there's a sheet that I put in the back. Um, and um, it tells you about my blog. I do try to keep that up, um, try to do it twice a week. I don't always make it. Um, this, this spring has been a little uh, problematic in keeping it up. But as I go through old newspapers, as I found some of the stuff uh, for Globe and things, I put that information on, cute little stories. Uh, uh, there was a lady uh, that was an actress that uh, went out and she went across the country advertising wool light and she took a sheep and she would wash it in wool light. And so then that's the reason why wool light was invented. Um, so, you know, just cute little stories. So if you, it, it's on that. It's also on my cards and on my uh, bookmark. So um, I also brought some wool. Um, one of the products off a of sheep is lanolin, and if you touch this, you're going to have a stickiness to you. That's the lanolin, and that's the reason why the bass women who are in their 80s that I know look like they're in their 50s, because they have that all over their skin when they're doing out with the sheep and stuff. So you can come up and uh, feel that. And I'll take any questions that you have. I don't know. I, I probably have gone over my time, and I apologize. Okay, I'm not over my time. Okay. <laughs> questions? I know I talked to some of you beforehand, so, yes. So if one wanted to see a sheep drive, you know, when they're moving in from south to north, how do you find out about that? Well, we don't advertise that. Um, I mean, I do take people. Um, I get with the houses and ask them if they will allow me to bring people. I had a, a hiking group. Uh, that wanted to do it, and they didn't want to be uh, co cooperative. So the next year, I never told them about it. Um, and I took one lady because she was real good, and uh, so I had no problem on that. Uh, but uh, if you want to know, keep in contact with me, and if we're going to do it, it will be in May of next year. Um, it's over on the um, uh, west side. Um, but the there's plenty of hotels and things in the area or camping or whatever, but it is a lot of fun and it's interesting to uh, see them, it, the dogs and them uh, in action. So, yes. I don't believe that the wild ones, it's because of all that wool coming down. And remember, these sheep have been uh, domesticated for 10,000 years plus. So they've been raised to grow the wool and I'm sure that they, they were looking for certain characteristics, just like we do with crops and breeding of them to give us that. They love the wildflowers. They'll eat a lot of the different uh, grasses and stuff. There is a local weed that is poisonous to them. Um, and so they wait till that's gone before they're going to take them on the trail. There may be some others, but I, uh, local weed is the one that sticks out in my mind that uh, when we trail them that we have to be concerned about. Anything else? Okay, all your grocery stores, like Fry's, Safeway, that's all lamb from New Zealand. Um, once in a while, and though of fall, Fry's will carry it from the United States. But in most cases, Sprouts, I know, it's all from New Zealand. And um, I buy mine from a gentleman in the valley, uh, Paul Rovey. 
and he, you know, as I said, he has those 18. He, he got into the business. He, he was the one that when the kids show their animals, you know, they, they hope then that they sell the animal, whether it goes off to somebody to keep or it's going to go off to be butchered. And if they don't sell it, he goes, it was his job to go and buy the, the animal from them, the cows and, and the sheep, the pigs. And um, that's how he got started on it. Then he had neighbors around him that decided they didn't want to have sheep anymore. And so he took those on. So now he has 1,800. Um, so, uh, you know, and he said, hey, that's good for him. But the FAA students, if you're going to show lamb at a, um, the fair, you have to go and buy the lamb. You cannot have the animal given to you. You have to go with your own money and you have to keep track of the, all your expenses. And that's the price then that you're hoping to get at the fair for that. And then that's how he knows that. And as he said, he always tries to help out the kids on that so he'll give them more. But some of the kids do real well on uh, selling their animals and things at the fair. And, and that's something that I don't know if they do it here in Gila County at the, at the county fair. Uh, they do. Because I was going to say, it, it, it is fun to go and, and uh, watch the judging and everything if you never have had the opportunity to do that. So it's really hard to know where you can buy domestic land. Um, they have, there is now, I think they passed it in Congress that they have to tell you where you're getting your meat from. But I don't know how soon that's going to go in. A lot of your grocers, they were not going to tell you that it's from out of the country because... Yeah, they don't, they don't care. They're not going to, right. But certain products they do, but meat they didn't have to. And now they, uh, the wool or the, the sheep and the cattle people got together and, and pretty well forced it on the uh, government. And I think it's only fair because why should we be buying New Zealand uh, lamb? Why aren't we doing our own? I mean, our industry is not doing that well at all here in the, in the United States. And so, well, thank you. Great questions. Thank you. Oh, thank you.